it's great to be part of this session. And the, uh, uh, the setup there from, from Mike and Gary is going to be really helpful uh, as I present. This is joint work with Oscar Jorda, so I have a, a Fed co author too, with the usual disclaimer, and Moritz uh, Skulrich. So, um, really, the last thing that, that Gary sort of said there sets us up for, for the motivation. And uh, what he was talking about was how fragility builds up, especially during uh, the preceding uh, credit boom. That was uh, from the paper with Guillermo Adonis. And that's going to be sort of the, the backdrop for, for this paper. Uh, but we're going back into history, and that's where, where Mike and Joe's paper helps set us up as well. And we're, we're going to be trying to understand something about how credit booms create fragility in the economy and what the ramifications or the after effects of that might be. So uh, this is a picture many of you will have seen before. This is a, a picture of all the crises we've had in history for as many countries as we, we can know about. Um, this is from the uh, Reinhardt Rogoff database. Uh, uh, Ken and Carmen were cited earlier, but, but I won't, I'm not going to refer to any of that dispute. And uh, what we see here are some interesting features of how often crises have occurred in history and they've been occurring more or less all the time, with the exception of one notable period. I've sometimes called it the, o the oasis of calm. Gary refers to it as the quiet period uh, after the Great Depression uh, and uh, World War II through the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, maybe into the mid-70s. There were really zero financial crises <coughs> in the advanced countries and only one or two in emerging market and developed economies. And it's interesting to speculate about why that period was so quiet, and maybe we'll get into that in the Q&A session. Um, there are going to be some uh, data points coming up in a moment that might speak to that. That was a period of very low leverage in the financial systems of most advanced countries, whereas at other times leverage was particularly high. And so we're going to be focusing on just the advanced countries in this discussion. This paper sets aside work that has been done by many authors, including Mike and people at the IMF and elsewhere, pooling together advanced and emerging economies. But of course, that raises the question uh, that maybe, you know, caterers is not paribus. So people have said, you know, I'm worried about, you know, pooling together lots of countries for this kind of analysis. So we're just going to focus on the advanced, or perhaps what should be properly called the, the, the countries formerly known as advanced, uh, uh, which, uh, w uh, and I'll describe the sample in a moment. But these were the countries that, that thought they were immune from this sort of thing, but now, of course, we, we know better. And uh, the kind of broader uh, intellectual uh, context for this is the debate over, of course, credit and financial factors in the business cycle. There's a long history of that. It seems that economists have, have suddenly uh, come, gone back to citing Fisher and Minsky and Schumpeter and lots of other people who talked about this a lot throughout the history of economic thought, but it wasn't something that was talked about very much in the last 20 or 30 years, but it's very much back right now. And the particular quote I've taken there is from James Tobin's review in the Journal of Economic Literature of Minsky's book, where Tobin sort of starts off in the first sentence or first paragraph saying, well, of course credit is the Achilles heel of capitalism. And to someone like James Tobin, that was an obvious statement. And, and now we've returned back to that. Um, this work obviously speaks to the debate about the aftermath of financial crises, which uh, Mike and Joe's paper has put front and center. And uh, obviously, uh, if you've been paying attention to the uh, recent uh, political shenanigans in, in, in late last year and the blogs of uh, Krugman and John Taylor, the other Taylor, uh, you'll have seen a lot of this discussed in gory detail. Uh, this paper is, uh, is in a long tradition of economic history trying to, trying to speak to these questions. Okay, So um, this, there's obviously been lots of narrative work by uh, you know, people like Charles Kindleberger and others and people looking at particular crisis episodes in particular countries but uh, our work is in the sort of f more formal quantitative tradition, econometric tradition uh, that Mike and others ha have worked on. In fact, I, the seminal paper for me uh, in this literature, um, and notwithstanding the fact that Mike just stood up and warned you about the perils of doing panel analysis and, and pooling lots of countries together, uh, the, 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 sh the, the big shoulders on which we all stand is this paper by Bordeaux, Icon Green. Klingel Beal and uh, Martinez Perea from 2001, which was a panel data study looking at, uh, I think, the, the twin or the triple crises, all the different varieties of crises that countries have had over time and also going back through history and finding that crises really did have significant damaging effects. And of course, that work uh, then fed into subsequent work by lots of people, including uh, Ken and Carmen in their book, This Time is Different, in, in some of their work on. Uh, in, in the journals uh, that's appeared since. Um, 
I want to point out, however, what we're doing differently in this paper, and what we're doing differently in this paper is circling back to the question of, of how credit builds up fragility, is to focus in on not questions of public debt, which are very much uh, the focus of other people's research, but to focus it in on the creation of private sector credit, and in particular bank credit. So I'm speaking more to the things that Gary was just talking about. So that's going to be the new thing in our work. So I want to emphasize what we're doing here and which gap, which hole in our empirical knowledge uh, has been filled in here. So before 2009, uh, we, we knew quite a lot about three things, but not about a fourth thing. So this is a two-by-two two box. If you want to know about crises, you need to know when they happen, and you need, to something, you need to know something about the balance sheet related to the crisis that is taking place. So you need a timing variable, and you need some kind of balance sheet measures. Um, we had pretty complete knowledge of that for sovereign crises, crises related to public debt, uh, work uh, by uh, my uh, U then UC Davis colleague Peter Lindert, by Mike Bordeaux and others, feeding into Reinhardt and Rogoff. Lots of databases being collected to there telling us when did countries have sovereign defaults, with little disputes here and there about what's really a default and you know was that voluntary or not, was it partial or not. There's, there's lots of inside baseball there that we're not going to get into, but we had that database. And we also knew a lot about the history of public debt, and Mike has done a lot of work on this. Uh, we knew how much sovereigns had been borrowing. Uh, there's been a lot of nitty-gritty work to figure out how much was external, how much was domestic, uh, which currency was it denominated in, original sin, all of that. But that's been very intensely studied, the stuff in, the stuff in that column, right? But we're at the right-hand column. Well, we knew about the dating of financial crises. People have gone back and studied uh, you know, when did financial crisis events occur? There's some debate there about the definition as well. The World Bank people like uh, Caprio and Klingerbeel et al., Levin and Valencia, people have gone back and maybe looked at the damage done in terms of, say, bailout costs, people thinking about you know, what's the intensity of an event. If, if just one bank fails, that's not really a systemic crisis. So people want it to be big enough to matter, and there can be uh, lots of inside baseball arguments there about particular events. But then there was this big hole where the big red question mark is about what did we know about what was going on behind these financial crises, what was happening in the banking sector that was generating all the credit that eventually led to the panic, the bank run, the flight, or the collapse in quality, or the closures of financial institutions that was associated with the crisis. And that's the gap that I filled, filled in with Moritz Schulrich and, and which appeared in our AER paper last year uh, called uh, Credit Booms Gone Bust. And there we collected a data set of uh, annual data for 14 advanced countries all the way back to 1870. Uh, we've since collected uh, data on three more countries, and we, we can extend it forward now through this crisis, which will not be in what we discussed today. That's out of sample from our study, but we will be soon be able to do that. And we collected data on aggregate bank balance sheets and aggregate bank loans. So one of those includes interbank lending, the other one loans, nets it out. And we're continuing to do archaeological work to dig up even more granular data. We've got data coming on uh, housing, mortgage lending, which is obviously very important, commercial lending, consumer lending, and so forth. Again, for all those countries, for all those years, which I think will help us then go on to attack other <coughs> hypotheses, such as is it mainly related to housing, which was uh, one of the uh, messages of the literature and, and was mentioned uh, by, uh, by Joe and Mike. Um, where does this fit into the current debate? Well, it fits in with work done by Atif uh, Mian, uh, the Mian and Sufi paper, and there's also the Midrigan and Philippon paper you may have seen. What are these pictures that I've just suddenly uh, sprung on you? They're pictures of leverage before the crisis and outcomes after the crisis. So the horizontal axis, I think, is sort of the same thing, maybe on these two charts. It's uh, debt, change in debt to income uh, ratios for households, maybe over different periods, or the run-up in leverage. Uh, in the Mian Sufi study, I think it's by county or SMSA, it's by sub-state regions or locations. In the Midrigan Philippon study, it's at the level of US states. And the vertical axis is maybe the one that's common, it's the change in employment, right? After the crisis, how much did you suffer in your particular region? And there's a negative correlation, right? So uh, places that ran up more uh, uh, leverage, uh, this is in, in terms of household debt, were the places that had the deeper recessions. And that suggests, you know, a conjecture, a hypothesis that credit is biting back, that the more credit you run up, uh, you know, the more that's going to be weighing on you, the debt overhang is going to create a, you know, a credit hangover and a, and a real economy hangover in the subsequent downturn. 
And the, the point of our paper is to say, is that an empirical regularity that applies more broadly across history, across countries? And to, do, to, ask, to answer that question, we say, well, we just need to change the unit of observation. Right? So in, in the Mian Sufi study, it's the US just in 2008, single cross-section at the county level. Right? So that's the unit of observation. For us, the unit of observation will be countries in going into recessions. So it'll be uh, you know, annual data on individual country recession observations. We'll have to try and tie what's going on to the, those countries' prior uh, credit boom experience. And that, in essence, is the goal of this paper. Um, and uh, to briefly try and convince you why that matters, I think it matters a lot for both policymakers and uh, for economists. There is going to be a stylized fact here, and it's going to match up exactly well with what Atif and others have said, which is that credit does seem to bite back. There does seem to be um, a lingering effect of what happened in the previous expansion in terms of credit uh, bubbling up and the volume of credit and how severe the subsequent recession is. And that's not going to be true just in financial crisis recessions, it's going to be true even perhaps in all recessions. Um, this result is not going to be based uh, on, a, on a small sample. Uh, Joe and Mike just, just presented a study based on, on 20 some, 27, I think, uh, US recessions. Um, and, uh, and only a subset of those being financial crisis recessions. This is going to take advantage, subject to the caveats, of using panel data. Uh, so we're going to have 233 recessions, uh, 173 of them normal recessions, and 50 of them uh, uh, financial crisis recessions. So we may have, therefore, a bigger sample and uh, a stronger basis for statistical inference. In fact, it's not really a sample. It's really the population. If you're, if you're interested in economic history and uh, the history of modern finance capitalism in the advanced world, well, this is pretty much it. Right? If you've got every country back to 1870 and all data on all recessions, and we're going we're to throw away the wars for obvious reasons and you know, get that out of the sample, but we're pretty much covering everything. Once we've, you know, we're, we're still cleaning up the data for Belgium, Finland, and Portugal. But once they're in, that's pretty much the entire thing you could study. So if you, can't, if you can't draw any inferences from what we're presenting here today, it may not be possible to draw any inferences uh, at all. And I hope that this will have some practical implications both for policymakers and, and economists. For policymakers, obviously, this is already a ball in play. We, we have policymakers at the BIS talking about this for a long time, now they're being listened to, which, which they, weren't, they weren't being listened to at Jackson Hole and other places before the crisis, but now they're being listened to quite a lot and we're having new rules about capital liquidity. We've got regulators, say, in the UK and other places, thinking about focusing on looking at credit growth as a possible variable of interest as they go forward with their design of macro prudential policy design. Right? So that's in some of the draft documents that just came out of the Bank of England in the last few months. So that might become an important variable. So we'd like to know, you know scientifically, historically, more about how that might have worked out. And then for macroeconomists, it, it, it's part of the argument that you know, uh, we've been ignoring credit as part of how the economy behaves over the business cycle. Uh, it's an important thing, it seems, not just in financial crises, but in normal recessions, and we may need to uh, improve our models to reflect that. Um, a few pr preliminaries uh, concerning uh, our data set, uh, which... Uh, I should mention. Uh, this is going to be the sample here. It's not going to cover the crisis. That's going to come in the next iteration, uh, 138 years. And these 14 countries, plus those extra three coming in our next update. Um, in some of the controlled uh, regressions I'm going to present later in the analysis, you know, once to control for the state of the economy, we're going to bring in other macro variables, leaning heavily on the work of Mike and others, covering real GDP, investment, CPI, the current account, interest rates, and so forth. But our, our key variable is going to be private bank loans. So that's the new variable that we've collected that is going to be, we think, the key conditioning or treatment variable that we want to pay attention to here. Uh, now, because we want to talk about recessions and crises, we need dates of those. We use a simple peak trough identification algorithm by Brian and Boshan for recessions. And we use our own set of dates on normal and financial recessions, which uh, again, relies on Mike's work and on Reinhardt and Rogoff. So uh, that's going to be uh, the state of, uh, of play in terms of data. And this is the new variable that we collected. So this is maybe the one that's least familiar because we, we, didn't, we didn't have it until recently. And this is a picture of what's been going on with bank loans and bank assets in the aggregate. 
And this is the average across all countries plotted by year, right? So if you were, so if, so if you were Friedman and Schwartz writing circa 1950 and you said, let's just focus on broad money, uh, that would be a sort of monetarist thing to do, you'd be looking at the blue series and saying, you know, M2 to GDP kind of summarizes what banks do. It's related to the size of their balance sheet. They may have, you know, variations in, you know, how much liquid stuff they own or how much cash is in the vault, but this is giving us a good proxy of maybe what's going on on the asset side by looking at the liability side, right? Okay, our new data are the green and the red lines, which are bank assets, red, and, and bank loans, blue, uh, relative to GDP. I think I said the wrong thing earlier. Broad money is the green series, not the blue series. So the broad, the broad money series is the green one, which is relatively flat throughout this period. And um, what leaps out from this chart, and it was one of those moments when you've been slaving in the archives and collecting all this data and getting covered in dust from books that no one's opened and you know, calling your, you know, your friends in New Zealand or Japan or wherever and saying, you know, where's the series on this? And finally, you put it all into Excel and then you dump it into Stata and you hit scatter plot, blah, 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 and you get this picture and you say, whoa, I didn't expect that. It was, it's sort of one of those, I mean, maybe you have to be an economic historian to be excited about this, but you know, we, we live for those moments because it seemed like, well, you know, we didn't know this. Uh, and, and these facts are kind of startling. Right? The, the fact is that the red and the blue lines behave very differently from the green line. Right? So before uh, 1900, there's a trend upwards, which I think reflects sort of financial deepening or financial development in some of the countries at least, uh, particularly I think Spain, Japan, Italy, other countries that are sort of, I don't know, semi-emerging in that period. Some of them may be emerging again soon. Uh, then it kind of levels off Right, uh, and going up to the Great Depression, you've kind of got those series kind of tracking along with GDP. Then, of course, they collapse. Right? We get uh, an endogenous collapse with the financial crisis of the Great Depression. In many countries, this is a, an average across 14 countries, so all of the annual variation and stuff is smoothed out a lot by that. But you can see that the trend there towards uh, financial collapse, credit crunch, massive withdrawal of lending, massive collapse in bank balance sheets. And then after, through the war and after the war, we enter the period of financial repression, great caution on the part of the financial sector in many countries, uh, a balance sheet which doesn't have many loans, isn't extending a lot of credit. And then the slow trend begins, starting in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the red and the blue lines come back, they break through the, the broad money to GDP line, they break through their previous highs, and they just keep on going up and up and up. Uh, roughly speaking, the, the, asset, the assets here are two times loans, but those series trend on and on, and eventually the loans break through broad money because, of course, banks can fund through non-monetary liabilities, so that, that trend uh, reflects that simple fact. Now, what we've shown in our earlier paper, the paper I mentioned where the data were presented, is that the credit variables here have some predictive ability. If you look at recent experience, the run-up in leverage in any particular period is a good leading indicator of whether you're about to enter a financial crisis. Right, that was the paper, uh, Credit Boom's Gone Bust. So that seems to suggest, well, whether you get into the financial crisis bin or not, if you think it was two bins, that's related to whether you've had a credit boom beforehand. But is there more to it than that? And in this paper, we're going to try and argue that there is more to it than that. The intensity of those credit buildups also affects the subsequent re re recession path right, and recovery path, which relates to, obviously, uh, the big debate that, that we've been having. So here's our business cycle chronology. This is, comes from the algorithm dating business cycle peaks and troughs for all of these countries. So you get a gigantic list of these 200 <coughs> almost 300 recessions, we throw out some of the wartime dates and the, area, the, the windows around the wars. And then we have to date them, are they a financial crisis recession or a normal recession? We say if there's a financial crisis within two years, plus or minus two years, we call it a financial crisis recession, otherwise we call it normal. And so there you see... It's the, the one that came from the, the earlier literature that uh, Mike has contributed to, Ken and Carmen. If you go to the appendix of Reinhardt and Rogoff's, this time is different, there's a gigantic list there. Uh, as in so many cases, people have idiosyncratic choices, so one of my co-authors is German. I think Reinhard Rogoff had a, a, a date for, I don't know, 73, maybe it was the Hirschstedt Bank. And my co-author said, well, that was a small thing. We're not going to call that a one. But, you know, if, you know people have, have had big arguments about which particular date matters, but in, in truth, I don't think changing any particular one is going to alter, alter the story here. Okay, so altogether then we're going to have, excluding the wartime window, 223 recessions 
um, and 50 of those are going to be uh, financial crisis recessions. Let's now turn to the, uh, the empirical analysis. So we're going to consider these like treatment variables. Uh, we're not going to say those are exogenous, although we could have maybe used credit and other things as instruments, and in, indeed other people are doing that, and so we might. But let's just think of this as our treatment variable. Are you in a financial crisis? That's 29% uh, of the recessions, or in a normal recession, 71%. And then we've got this other measure, which is the history of credit during the previous expansion. That corresponds to the measure that kind of Artif and others were using to look at the 2008 recession in the US. And we, we can construct an average of that in percentage points per year, how much extra credit is piling up in your banking system. That's averaging about 0.47 in all recessions. Interestingly, much higher in financial recessions, 1.26 percentage points per year, lower 0.24 percentage points per year in normal recessions. And that's just the average reflecting what I said earlier, that there's some predictive ability here. The more uh, excess credit building up in the period before, the more likely you are to be in the F bin versus the N bin. So we're going to use these to do uh, now conditional forecasts of your recession path. So the thought experiment is, imagine you're in the Federal Reserve, you're Ben Bernanke, you're sitting there on the desk, and there's, you've got a little dashboard, right? So there's a little light that flashes when the recession starts. So you don't have to wait for Marty Feldstein and the MBR to take 18 months and figure out what's going on, and then they finally tell you. Imagine it just goes off. So that's, that's a data point, right? It says recession. And then there's a little needle, which is, you, you probably do observe more or less in real time, telling you how much credit is built up, right? And as a policymaker, the thing is, is that information helpful? Does it, is that gonna tell you anything about where you are heading next? And how do, I mean, how does the future look conditional on those uh, pieces of information. And the first thing we'll do is just look at it unconditionally, just based on these three things that are in this slide, and then we'll put the adi additional conditioning information in there. So here are the unconditional recession paths. So this is just putting in the dummies for normal and financial recessions. So this is the first order question. Are financial recessions deeper and longer than normal recessions? And the answer is yes. You can see in year one, you lose about 2% of GDP. This is real GDP per capita. This is normalized to the peak year, which is year zero. Normal recession, you're normally back to the datum, back to zero in year two, and then growth continues two percentage points more in year three. You're up to 3.3 and 4, 4.5 in year five. These are cumulative, estimated by direct projection. Financial recession, however, you're below zero for three years. You're significantly <coughs> below zero. You're at minus 3.1 in year two, minus 2.5 in year three, and you're not significantly different from zero in years four and five. So you're barely clawing your way back to where you started after five years. Those effects are going to be preserved, but next we put in the interactions. We want to bring in that excess credit variable that we spent so many years and so much pain collecting and, and argue that it matters. So we interact that variable in each bin. Let me take, take it to deviation from the mean and interact it with, with the indicator for normal and the indicator for financial those effects are also going to turn out to be statistically significant, and I'll develop that uh, in more detail. First, I'll show you the unconditional paths. Now we have a continuous treatment as well as the binary treatments. So I'm going to illustrate it here by plotting the paths for normal and financial recessions when that excess credit is at its mean. Those are the solid lines. And then I'm going to do the thought experiment of saying, now suppose I feed in an extra percentage point of credit in that preceding expansion. How would it affect the, uh, the recession path and the recovery path? And you can see here it's pushing it down. Right? So that's the sort of calibration here when you add in maybe one or two or three percentage points of extra credit per year. And remember the standard deviation of that excess credit was about two. Right? So this is like half a standard deviation, one, one and a half. Okay, so it looks like there's something there. It looks like financial recessions and recoveries are worse than normal, recessions and recoveries, and they're even worse when you go in leveraged up. Okay, you may say, well, is that robust? First of all, you haven't, told, you haven't done any conditioning on the state of the economy when you go in. So now we do a full-blown uh, local projection with also conditioning variables, if you like, uh, effectively doing a VAR. So it's a VAR with regimes. We don't have to estimate a lot of VAR parameters. We just directly project out from year zero, but we condition on the state of the economy <coughs> in addition to our treatment variables. Okay? So we can vary then each of the treatment variables, controlling for all of the other things like investment or interest rates 
or growth and lags of growth of GDP and all of that. So we're going to basically throw in all of this kitchen sink stuff to try and destroy our result. And if we fail, then that's good news for our result. So this is basically what we compute. So this, uh, this last term here is the kitchen sink, but we're hoping, we're hoping to find the, that our results are robust. These are the treatment variables, N and F, the binary treatments, and the continuous coefficients beta on the credit interaction terms. OK, the results are there, but it's easier to see in a picture. Basically, the interactions become more significant. The, the binary treatments remain as, uh, more or less the same as they were before. And, and here's the picture. Right? So everything I'm showing you here is statistically significant. And what's interesting is once you bring in the conditioning information, it doesn't change the financial recession paths very much. Uh, but now that even the normal recession paths are showing kind of a quant quantitatively, qualitatively significant impact of credit from the prior uh, expansion on the path of the recession and recovery. So I think that's very interesting and, uh, and potentially an important result. I'll say two more things, because I think I'm almost out of time. Sorry. Um, first of all, I focused everything on the path of output after the peak. But there's, uh, I mean, but, but you can use this technique of doing local projections and conditioning on that set of variables for any variable in your system. And when you do that, you get surprisingly intuitive and commonsensical results. So here I'm showing all seven variables, and so I don't have lots and lots of dotted, dotted and dashed lines to confuse you, and it wouldn't be visible at this resolution. I focused on just the one standard deviation experiment where, I, where in the prior expansion we're going to have zero excess credit or plus one standard deviation. Right? So blue is normal, red is financial. Uh, the shaded area is the confidence inter interval for the normal recessions. And then the dashed lines are when we feed in extra excess credit in the historical expansion. And the first picture is what we've seen already. The excess credit will tend to drag down the output path in the, in the recession and recovery. The second picture sh shows um, and that'll be worse when you have extra credit and it's worse in financial. The second picture says, for investment, that will be much worse after a financial crisis, and it too will be dragged down by a credit uh, hangover. Third picture, inflation. Generally speaking, financial crises are a bit more disinflationary, or not as inflationary, as episodes following normal recessions. But if we feed in a, a lot of excess credit, as you see here, the red dotted line for CPI prices, is very far below uh, the rest of the line, suggesting that when you have a financial crisis with the legacy of a large credit boom, you're in for a lot of incipient uh, deflationary pressure, which seems to correspond with what we've been seeing in the last five years. Other predictable results, real lending collapses. It collapses a lot in a financial recession, and it collapses even more when the financial system comes in with a very large balance sheet. Government short-term interest rates, that's like the central bank rate. After a financial crisis, they're lower for longer. After a financial crisis with a big balance sheet, they're even lower for even longer. Long-term rates, similar picture. Current account generally moves towards surplus in recessions. Um, not very different in financial recessions, but again, when you have this big hangover, think of maybe changes in Spain or Ireland or some of these places that are having financial crises right now, big moves towards surplus. So a lot of things there that, uh, that may line up with experience, uh, looking at the average over, over our 233 uh, recession experience. Um, but let's focus it now finally onto just the most recent um, period. And if you like, this is an out of sample check on what we've just been talking about, because this paper and the results I've all present, I presented, they all end before the current crisis. So what we did, um, during the, the viral discussions of last fall was to do an out-of-sample check for the US and the UK. So we took, literally, our model, and we just fed in the historical variables for the US and the UK going up to their <coughs> business cycle peak uh, in 2007. And that meant computing, you know, are they in a normal or a financial crisis recession? Duh, that was the easy part. <laughs> they're, both in, they're both gonna be compared to the financial crisis path. But we've made a big song and dance about how you have to condition the path also on the legacy of excess credit growth during the previous expansion. So we computed that for the US and the UK, interacted it with the coefficient, fed that in. That was going to bring down 
the path even further because those were very big credit booms in both of those countries. But that's not all. Not only did we have credit booms in those countries, in the banking system, which is the historical variable we've been using going back to 1870, these countries also had shadow banking systems, which is what Gary was talking about. And that didn't exist in the historical sample. I mean, certainly before 1990, there probably wasn't a significant shadow banking system anywhere. And still in many countries today, it's not as big as it is in the US and the UK. Uh, so we had to go out and get some kind of estimate of how much shadow bank lending had been created. And for that, we leaned on, on friends like Tobias Adrian of the New York Fed and others. And we went through the Fed funds and came up with numbers to give like a range, a prediction range. And so what you see here is that um, excess credit by banks was about plus 0.5% percentage points per year during the expansion. But if you add in the shadow banking system, it went up to 3.75. So it was really you know, almost two standard deviations outside of historical experience going back over a century. And more. UK, similar, actually came to 3.75 when you added in banks and shadow banks. It was maybe more focused on the traditional banking system, slightly smaller on the shadow banking system. So we said, hey, let's have some fun with this. There's a little bit of a debate going on. Uh, plot those trajectories. If you took the model literally, where would the US and UK have gone after 2007? Those are the pink bands. The upper one is just traditional banking only. And the lower line, the lower boundary of the pink band is with shadow banking thrown in. Quite pessimistic trajectories. Um, but, oh look, the US seems to be actually creeping along and even poking its way out of the top uh, boundary of that predicted range. Um, unfortunately, the story for the UK is, is not so good. It was uh, in the middle of its range, but now uh, has dropped through the bottom. So, uh, that's to sum up. Uh, we think the credit intensity of the boom matters. Financial, risk, financial crises are worse than normal crisis recessions. Sorry, financial crisis recessions are worse than normal recessions, but there's this extra ingredient in there which is the magnitude of the credit boom, is another important determinant uh, of your fate. And uh, as I suggested earlier, there's much more to come because we're doing even more granular data. We're going to look at other questions. Uh, will, you know, is it, there's an open question, is what you gain during the boom offset by what you lose during the bust? That's something we'd like to systematically examine. We'd like to compare the role of public and private debt and credit. And we also want to obviously look at policies such as fiscal and monetary policy impacts and how they interact with this variable over time. But that's all we have for now. Thank you.